Um, okay, so we're on. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, okay, why does Jean look and sound like shit today? <laughs> or, what, uh, or why more than usual, at least? Uh, because so <laughs> I had a little mishap with my flight yesterday coming back from Germany. I was actually... Um, well, the flight was late, and then I missed my connecting flight, and so I was stranded in London last night. So I um, woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, London time, to, um, to make my way over here. Yeah, I woke up in London. <laughs> um, so I think that was midnight your time. So I'm on a long day already, but I actually feel great um, because I... Um, because it's like 8 p.m. for me or something like that, or 9 p.m. maybe. So it's not so bad. Um, so, but yeah, that was a, a little annoying, the whole, you know, escapade with the flight. I did randomly meet Steven Pinker. Who knows who that is? He was, he was on the same flight as me going to England and, and had the same mishap happen as me. So there's like a bunch of us at the desk for British Airways, you know, trying to figure out what to do and then it was like a, a couple of us and one of them was Steven Pinker so went until he's this this um, like uh, I don't know author psychologist at MIT it's pretty well known anyway I told him all about you guys so he knows he knows about the neural aesthetic so so that's awesome anyway um, what are we doing so there's two weeks left in um, two lectures left basically in this this should be Oh, come on. It's a gif. Should be eating popcorn. Anyway, um, so there's, we have three weeks left. One is going to be the final projects week. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited for that. We've really kind of shown most of the practical stuff that you're going to, you know, sort of be expected to be able to use by the last week. So these next two weeks are not going to be super practical. I'm going to kind of like along the way of showing you these, ex, you know, extraneous miscellaneous topics, give you some resources and look at some notebooks. But for the most part, I, th I think, you know, you can kind of be planning your projects out and maybe thinking about using the stuff you've already used. But I don't know if something strikes your fancy during today or next week, then, you know, by all means, everything is fair game. And uh, the way I thought uh, we would kind of divide it up, basically these last two weeks, I, uh, this is what I did last year as well, I just want to use to show you everything we haven't covered. Uh, because we kind of divide most of the course material up into two units, which is, you know, the first unit was kind of like interactive machine learning in ML5. And then the second unit, it was, you know, generative models. And so there's, a, there's just a whole lot of stuff that's really interesting about this field. Um, that I, I feel like you guys would like to, to see. I'm going to go kind of fast through this. I just want to show you, you know, because we don't necessarily have to cover anything in great detail, but, um, you know, I just feel like it would be such a tragedy if we didn't get to show you all these cool things that are... Um, so there's like 150 slides, but uh, a lot of them are going to last for like five seconds. So, so get ready. And then next week, um, next week should be really fun. I, I'm going to show you some like more futuristic kind of... This is all going to be today, kind of basically text and audio. You know, we haven't really done a lot of text and audio, so I, I feel like you guys want to know more about that. And next week will be something uh, more futuristic stuff, so like the frontiers of AI. So that should be kind of really, uh, really exciting. And then uh, I also want to mention that uh, I'll return to AI, AI, <laughs> AI lab on Friday, um, how many of you went to either of the last two sessions? So Dan and Ellen both did sessions again this week. So that was um, that was great of them to step up. Uh, I'm gonna. I was thinking to. Oh, I didn't. Did I? Oh yeah, that's in the next slide. Okay, so I'll mention AI Lab in a second. Uh, yeah, this is kind of what we're doing today, and also um, yeah, we have to do these course evaluations, which which. Um, uh, I think you, you must have all received an email that says you have to evaluate this class. So at some point, I don't know, maybe we'll just kind of cut class early or something and then just have you do that. But at some point we have to do that. So if I forget, please like remind me. Um, and uh, yeah, just start thinking about presentations. And look at that cute dog. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is what I want to do for AI Lab. How many of you were at this when I did it last year? 
I don't know. Nobody? Okay. So what's going on here? You recognize some of these people? Uh, I'm going to do a tutorial on Glow, which I'm actually um, excitedly porting to a collab this week. So usually Glow was kind of, you know, you'd have to you'd have to mount it on some environment. But now uh, actually it turns out that I can do it really nicely on, on, um, on collab. So I'm going to make that available and then we'll do a little tutorial here. So that's really fun. So if you want to do like put, put a picture of yourself you know and do all these kinds of uh, well this is all the face interpolations so we can do those but then also uh, we can do stuff like um, making yourself look old or giving yourself blonde hair or, or you know or to someone else um, so all that stuff is pretty fun as well so AI yeah. lab is on Friday this yeah. Friday yeah yeah and school is open I think oh wait a second oh Thursday, oh we totally that's right oh yeah it's Thanksgiving but, but Saturday is Oh, no, I think that will work. Um, oh, okay. So no AI lab this Friday. <laughs> no one's going to be here on Friday, right? I'll just do it next week, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah. Oops. And yeah. So 30, 30 millisecond delay up here today. So, so just, you know, watch out for that. Okay. No AI lab. I'll announce it next week. Um, oh, you guys must be off tomorrow too? Or is it? Is the, okay. Oh. The floor will be open. The floor will be open. Oh, because I have office hours and stuff. Is anyone signed up for office hours? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll be here. Okay, um, let's talk about let's talk about recurrent neural networks. Um, I've, I've mentioned these occasionally, and, um, well, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what they do. Um, the first thing to, to kind of encapsulate in your mind is, you know, what a feed-forward neural network is. So we haven't really used the word feed-forward because all the neural networks we've, we've looked at so far are feed-forward. Feed-forward means that you have, you know, layer upon layer upon layer, and the signal travels from one, from the input layer to the output layer, and that's it. And it ne the weights never change, nothing like that. It just kind of does a job. You put in the same input, you get the same output every single time. And so you can kind of take all of that and compress it into a diagram that looks like this. You know, you have a you have a neural network that has a whole bunch of weights. You multiply x, which is your input, by those weights, and you get a y. Feed forward neural network, right? The uh, limitations of that is that they're static, right? So they don't really have any. They don't change over time. So we'll talk about why they need to change over time. Sometimes they do not take advantage of context, which means that. You know, there, well, there is no notion of context or order so much. I mean, there's kind of pixel order, I guess you could say, but there's no sort of, um, we'll get into like, when we talk about something like attention, the idea of context might make more sense. And also it operates on fixed input and output vectors, right? You get an image, it's got some size, you get an output classification that's got some size. And so there, those are always the same, same size. Um, and of course, like if you want to deal with text, you know, text is of a of an unlimited size. You know, a sentence, different sentences have different amounts of words or characters or whatever. And so these are kind of limited in their sense. Uh, so feed forward neural networks don't really have any way of dealing with this. Um, so the difference between an RNN, a recurrent neural network, is that it, is that it, it the signal can actually travel backwards, essentially, or not exactly backwards, but the idea, really the core idea of an RNN is that it has some kind of an internal state, which is kind of comparable to weights. It's almost as though the weights can change every time it receives a new input. So it's got this recurrence built into it. And the most popular kinds of RNNs, I think I'll mention later, we won't, we won't really look at how these work internally too much, but the most popular are LSTMs. So you've, you know, if you, you've probably heard of LSTMs, if you've covered, if you've um, you know, if you've been covering this stuff. And so um, those are the most popular, but there's other kinds as well. And RNNs are kind of interesting. They, they seem to go in and out of style. Uh, not just, I mean, like even in research, it seems like um, maybe three or four years ago, they were like the hot, hottest thing in the, around, you know. Uh, but then like uh, a lot of stuff, like WaveNets came around and did audio without recurrent neural networks, which, you know, People have been doing audio, things like audio and text work well, you know, modeled as a recurrent neural network, modeled with a recurrent neural network. But, um, you know, suddenly someone did WaveNets and WaveNets actually just use convolutional neural networks, just like images. And then, you know, GPT-2 actually isn't recurrent either. 
So they seem to be kind of down right now, but I feel like they're you know due for a resurgence. They just kind of go in and out of style. <clears throat> the idea is that um, the way that they get trained um, is that they sort of get unrolled. So let's say you have like a sequence of characters, right? And you're trying to create a neural network that would predict what the next character in the sequence would be. So, you know, you receive, you're trying to, you know, you get the string, hello world, and you're trying to model what happens after you get an H, what happens after you get an H-E, what happens after you get H-E-L, you know, and so on. Um, then the way that these get trained is that they're sort of unrolled and then the thing, the your input and output is kind of like the string and then the output is the string offset by one. You know, it's like H, per, H this input predicts this output, this input predicts this output, so you get H goes to E, E goes to L, L goes to L and so on to model hello world. And so... Um, and so in, in that sense, they, they start to like, they kind of look like feed forward neural networks when you unroll them to some, uh, you know, to, to some limited extent. Um, and that's kind of how they're trained. Yeah. Um, and then the nice thing about them, they're very dynamic. You know, you can kind of like input a few character or input a few inputs, let's say, in sequence and then output a few outputs if you want, or maybe just output one. Or maybe you input one and output multiple. You know, there's all this kind of dynamic ways of configuring them, and, and we'll, I'll show you some examples of that in the in the second. Um, some applications, like the most well-known application is of uh, sequence to you know RNNs, and especially like sequence to sequence RNNs is language translation. That's how Google Translate works. It uses, as far as I know, it uses um, it uses some kind of a I think a word level RNN. LSTM or something like that to translate different pairs of languages. Actually, they might have changed it by now to something slightly more complicated, but but that would be the that would be the standard way, let's say, of doing language translation. So you know, somewhere out there, there's a big parallel database of English and French, a bunch of English sentences, a bunch of French sentences, and then the um, you know the way that that's modeled is. Every, every word is associated with a word vector, which is something we'll, we'll talk about later today. And then uh, your input is kind of like a sequence of word vectors and your output is another sequence of word vectors in a different language. And so you get um, this kind of like a setup. And so you can translate languages, but you know, of course it's, you can translate anything so that you, know, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, what one, you could translate dialects, you can translate, um, I don't know what would be like. A, I, th I think I have a few examples of this later, so maybe I'll just save those. Um, so you can. So this is an example of when you input. You can condition on a single input. Like maybe you can condition the RNN on an image, and then get a sequence of words or something like that after. So what would that be? That would be image captioning. Yeah. Can it be an image and then? You said sequence of words. Can that be like a sequence of numbers? Yeah, it could be a sequence of anything. Numbers. Yeah. Let's say it's like three viewpoints, and then an image to the to those points. Yeah. Is that? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Based no no reason units, it can't be that. Units of sequence, right? So I think yeah, yeah. This is unit sequence where there's just one, you know, one input given. So you know, it can be conditioned on an image, or it can be conditioned on PoseNet. Let's say it can be conditioned on. All sorts of things, like really, really flexible. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, that's Im image captioning works that way. So that's your IM to text. So, you know, this is, you know, describing all of these images with a sentence. So man in black shirt is playing guitar. Girl in pink dress is jumping in air. Um, so... Really, really, um, and this this is already going back four years. So the state of the art has actually gotten gotten somewhat better already. Um, I think I'm text is kind of the best open source model out there. Um, but yeah, we've we've almost solved image captioning, which is pretty um, pretty interesting. So the, yeah, and this is just kind of another view of it. The idea is you get an image as your input. It goes through maybe some convolutional neural network, and that um, this arrow should maybe go to this X. That becomes the input to a recurrent neural network, which then sort of drives the neural, the hidden state of the network into some, some region. 
and that region is adept at describing dogs. You know, you, you could think of it maybe that way, at the, in the high-level way. Um, then, then, you know, then this kind of just getting into some applications of, um, of you know, recurrent neural networks, you know, so, so skip dot vectors is, is also just an example of image to text. I think I showed this at some point, maybe. I don't remember if I ever had the slide up. But um, this was kind of like image to text that was conditioned on romance novels. So I really like to include this slide because it's funny. So, you know, you send it a picture of the beach and then it goes, we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind. And then it just kind of goes into sort of romance novel territory. Um, do you feed the whole text? Like, do you give the whole text? It was trained on some like corpus of romance novels, okay. something like that. Yeah. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, and then yeah, this this is a uh, like Samim did this thing where um, Samim is this guy online also does a lot of cool AI art stuff, um, and he just generated some little romantic stories about various pictures that you know that are more or less comical. We were men in a tense position at the end of the meeting, and I looked up at my best friend. Of course, I had no intention of letting him go. Um, yeah. <laughs> he wanted to strangle me considering the beautiful boy I'd become wearing his boxers. <laughs> um, then dense captioning is kind of the same thing, but, um, but actually it works on subregions of an image and gives you multiple captions. So, you know, here's a, a small bowl of sauce, a plate of food, a slice of meat, a cup of coffee, a glass of water, and so on. All of these models are um, are available on Runway, by the way. So DenseCap is out there. I think maybe at some point we did a demo. I don't remember. And also, uh, I'm text is kind of the you know the non-dense version of it. Um, and then this is just me trying to be funny with it, you know, not having success. Actually, I did I did uh, have some success. So oops. So this was like way back when the Boston Dynamics robot came out and I thought, do you, you guys remember this video? And so I just thought it would be funny to see what Dense Cap thinks, a white and blue motorcycle. Because never goes like a, ro a robot, you know, man standing in front of a store. Also the crazy thing is that fucking dynamics is also the robot type of thing. So man, this is pretty good. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. yeah oh yeah, yeah, this, this thing does like, backflips yeah. and stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Has anyone seen Spot? The adorable little dog. Yeah, they're pretty good. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is already... This is pretty scary. This is the beginning of Terminator, I'd say. Um, so, yeah, super cute. And then this was the same thing except running it on Deep Dream. So I just thought it'd be funny to like run this on Deep Dream. The head of a bird, you know, the head of a dog. You know, lots of dogs. Yeah, I mean, it's so got, you know, else, maybe it's wishful it's thinking. Robot, it's wishful thinking on the part of the robot. Yeah. Um, then there was this whole category of text to image, uh, you know, that came out. And then this was like stack end. This kind of started that, but um, it was really limited to just like birds and flowers. And so, it, but it, but it, you know, so you would input a, a, a sentence describing a bird or a flower generally. I mean, you could do anything, but, but it was trained on birds and flowers and then it would generate, you know, nice birds and flowers. And then this was a precursor. Oh yeah. And then it showed how it has its own latent space that you could play with. And this was a precursor to attention GAN, which, which is the same thing, except not just birds and flowers, but kind of everything. Maybe, you know, maybe not to, I mean. Like the, this is the kind of thing that I would expect um, is going to get a nice, you know, kick in the ass pretty soon because because this is already maybe two years ago, I feel like. And so, you know, this is this is a billion dollar one, you know, tech good, you know, and because we have really good generative models. We have really good language embeddings. And so, you know, it's just a matter of time before they're they're connected really, really well. I'm surprised they haven't been that something hasn't been, you know, better than attention again. The, look out for this one. Like I bet you, before we run this class again, it's gonna be, it's gonna be upgraded. 
Um, the, I, the fact that you can do IM to text, image to text, and text to image opens you up to, you know, great feedback loop ideas. So this is actually like one that was made by um, a former workshop student of mine, Jake Elwes. Or El, how do you pronounce that name properly? Els, Els, Elwes. Anybody? Um, Jake's a good friend. He's he does really cool, neat stuff online. Sky is blue and clear. Then it generates an image from from what he wrote, and then it you know goes back where it has a red beak, um, and it just kind of goes on like that. More I am to text examples. Person on the beach flying a kite person skiing down the snow covered slope and so on um, then this is sequence to unit so you input a bunch of all the stats attention again so you input a sequence and then you get some kind of a static output so that's another thing you could do that's that's your attention again um, let's skip this this is kind of like maybe how RNNs work a little bit uh, and you know the, these are really just crazy like to, to understand I don't really even understand them but um, if you want to understand how LSTMs work, this is a really great article by, by Chris Ola, which um, explains them really nicely. You know, if you kind of understand the, the basics of, of backprop, you know, gradient descent, then, then you can understand how LSTMs work. It's just kind of a way of, of configuring the graph, right? And so, but, but, what, but it's, it's important to know at least the following, which is that whenever you hear about RNNs, they're all, they all have a type of cell which is so like they're made up of cells and then an LSTM is a type of cell. There's other kinds of cells, like the, I guess the ones that I know are like G, GRU, GRU cells, which is gated recurrent unit or something like that. And they just all have different ways of, they're like, almost like electrical circuits, you know? It's just kind of how you configure these and what operations you put into them and why you put them. So LSTMs are, they were invented to, in order to try to retain kind of or something like memory like you know you could have something that persists over a long period of time using what are called uh forget gates and re remember gates i think memory gates I forgot uh one of these is a memory gate and one of these is a forget gate something like that um it's crazy stuff oh, oh, they were yeah. using it for um for choreography stuff yeah 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 yeah, I think that's core RNN. I, I don't know if I have a slide in that, but that's a that's a remind me to mention that because that's that's actually a good one. Um, so every who, so this was like this was all of the rage at ITP when I first came here. Actually, like um, um, when I first taught my class here, char RNN was everybody's favorite thing, and that kind of started by from this blog post by Andre Karpathy, who's now the director of AI at Tesla. So he was a grad student when he wrote this. And now he's the director of AI Tesla, so that just tells you what the deep learning, you know, um, you know, revolution has 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 done. Um, so so uh, Andre Kapathy wrote this article called "The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks," where he trained a uh, character level language model. So it would predict. It was exactly what we mentioned with the Hello World example. It would predict every the next character of the next character in the sequence of characters of text and so if you have that you can you can use it in the following way like let's say you took a corpus of a database of shakespeare and it's just you threw in all of william shakespeare's works into a big text file and you had the the neural network learn how to predict the next character after you know and let's say it has this window of, of 32 characters or something. So whatever the previous 32 characters are, the neural network must predict the next one. So it becomes really good at predicting what the next character, which is really weird, right? Because characters by themselves are meaningless. But, you know, if the last 32 characters contain some words, then maybe you can kind of, you know, learn the association without understanding the word. And so the way that you could run these to produce text is that you have a neural network that produces it, that predicts the next character, right? And so you predict the next character, you grab it, and then you input it back into the, into the recurrent neural network, predict the next character, and then back in, predict the next character, and so on. You just run there in a feedback loop. Um, and that's how char, that's how char RNN works. How, you know? how long do you do the feedback loop? You do it as until you feel like stopping. Yeah. 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 yeah.
pretty much. I mean, there's there's also little things that people do, like you can create, for example, special tokens, which are like characters, but they're characters which mean something like like end the sentence now. And, you know, your program says whenever you get an end, end sentence token, you stop. So that's that's something you can do. Mm -hmm. With that sort of model, do you need to like seed it with 32 characters to start? No, no, no. That's just like a parameter that's selected in the training, you know, and it reads the text and it keeps a rotating, you know, or, or sorry, it keeps a like a moving, shifting window. How does it, what does it start with? Um, so it, it uh, I guess it would, oh, that's a good question. Like when they're right in the beginning, I, th I guess it, oh, that's a good question, actually. I don't know. I think maybe it maybe it just starts with zeros, or it could be that it just starts with one and then two, and then once it gets to thirty-two, it, it then starts cutting it off. Maybe it does that actually. I suppose it depends on the implementation. Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was trained on Shakespeare, generating you know, kind of coherent but kind of not coherent Shakespeare. Why Salisbury must find his flesh and thought that which I am not apt, not a man and in fire, to show the reigning of the raven and the wars, to grace my hand reproach within. So, okay, it doesn't make any sense, like it doesn't say anything, but it looks, it kind of feels like Shakespeare, and it remembers how to do sort of, um, you know, name the name of the person, the character, and then, you know, even remembers actual characters like King Lear. Um, and so, you know, it just it makes, you know, like... Uh, makes sort of funny sounding Shakespeare. And um, well, I would read the, the um, I would read the blog post to get more of this. It's, 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 it's very, um, well, it's, an, it's a very enlightening post, let's say. And so, you know, Karpazi talked about how, how it uh, would learn, you know, so like when you first start training it, it just, you know, does random sort of stuff like this. And slowly it begins to learn that there's like spaces in between some of the character sequences and then it starts to learn like things that look kind of like words and then slowly it gets more and more better right until it um yeah um and he showed a bunch of examples like you know on xml so this is fake xml and, and the the neat thing about this is that it remembers and this is where it, it kind of shines against something like a, a markov model which is kind of the way people used to do text bots which uh, here it actually remembers to close page tags, let's say. So there's page and then end page, revision, end revision. So LSTMs have this ability to kind of like remember, oh, I opened the parenthesis and I have to close it later. Um, to some, sometimes it'll forget, but, um, but otherwise it's actually, it's, well, it's pretty good at it, right? And they just did it, most of these are just jokes. So he then trained it on the whole Linux kernel, which is like a million, I don't know, like millions of lines of code. And so this is this is fake C++. Um, now you can't, you know, we're, we're, people are actually trying to develop, you know, like bots that write code, and which is, that's when we're screwed, right? Like that's when, when the bots can write code, it's like, because <laughs> then they're going to write better neural networks and then, you know, who knows? Who knows where that leads, right? But um, but yeah, this wouldn't compile if you tried it. It will have some typos or something. But uh, it is pretty. You know, this is actually. It even makes up its own weird comments. Free our user pages pointer to place camera if all dash. Now we want to deliberately put it to device. Yeah. Um, math papers. This is my favorite, of course, because. Uh, so math papers, you know, equations are actually just text in a special format called LaTeX. Um, I, I know because I used to write them. And they're, you know, it's just text, you know, it's like ending slashes, it's like markdown in a sense. And so it generates its own equations. This was trained on like the theoretical math papers, so it's really abstract. You know, it's like you can't even really tell. To prove study, we see that FU is a covering of X and T is an object, of, you know is a unique morphism of algebraic stacks. Note that, Would and, that sense, or is it oh, no, 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 of course right. not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it depends on what you mean by make sense. Does it make, if you saw a real algebraic topology paper, would it make sense? <laughs> so, but, it, but it's great, because it also makes up its own, like, weird diagrams and stuff. Um, yeah, 
And uh, yeah, I really recommend looking at the looking at the the blog post. So there's another section where they where they show you can of course you can measure the activations, right? Just in all all neural networks, you can always measure activations. And so in LSTM cells, the um, like each of the each of the activations might correspond to some feature that you can interpret. You know, remember how we interpreted like this neuron is looking for faces, and I can tell because it's lit up for faces. Right. And so this cell seems to be looking for end of line characters. It's sort of like, you know, it's bright blue until until it gets to a really low signal. And that signifies that it must be nearing an end of line character. Right. This one, rem this one sees that this it's like uh, we're inside of a quote. Um, inside if statements and so on. It's a lot of a lot of really, uh, yeah, a lot of like really interesting kind of uh, stuff there. So this is just a bunch that I did. I, I trained one, uh, Charlie RNN, on George W. Bush, like State of the Union speeches. So in the forces of success, members of Congress are working on the extremists and changing discretionary spending below inflation. This is just like, this is really like, oh, I trained it on my own email. This is a really great thing. So like, if you want to do a personal Char RNN, right, it's like, fine, you know, what is the biggest amount of text that you yourself have generated? And you have probably written a lot of email. So if mm -hmm. you can find a way to download all of your sent emails and then run it through Char RNN, you get like a little bot that types like you. Um, so that's, that's pretty funny. Um, it even makes up its own like fake URLs. So I used to read slash dot. <laughs> Right, and, and you know, this wouldn't go anywhere, but it's still pretty cool. I also trained it on my own journal. So like I keep a little sort of like a, like a little journal, like, like what I did today, you know, what I worked on, who I saw, that kind of stuff. And so when I train, and I've been doing this for seven years. And so, um, so I actually have written a lot of text. And so all of this, it's like, it's like pseudo personal, mm -hmm. which is that like, if you read it, it looks as though I wrote it. But like these are all fake memories, and it even combines like name. There are like fake names that look kind of like my friends' names, and they're in different countries, but they're combined together into these weird new memories. So it's just like really kind of weird stuff. You can train it on different languages as well. So you know this is just on Cyrillic. So this is this was trained on War and Peace. So it's just uh, just looks like Russian. <laughs> how, how do you do it on different languages? The same way you would do it on any other text. Just use yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there, there is some weirdnesses. Um, depending on the implementation, you might you might run into problems with like the it has to be I forget like the encoding you know UTF eight or something or ASCII. Um, it depends on the implementation how it handles that. It it, it needs to be able to read it obviously. Um, yeah. Then uh, lots of people started using it for various. So like after Char N was published, tons of people began to use it as a really really big thing for like a good solid year or two. Um, so this was trained on recipes. So this is great. Uh, like, <laughs> so Chinese meat of two or salad, <laughs> and then it lists all the ingredients. You know, like a recipe does, and it's got unsweet medium potatoes, chopped onions, vinegar, sesame seeds, tarragon, lemon juice, blah blah blah. But then I, what I love is that then it starts to do the instructions and it uses completely different from ingredients from what it listed. So, so, so that's, that's pretty funny. Pierced crumbs by handles and prepared off chilled. Yeah, this is made by, by somebody. Um, Kyle McDonald, who used to teach here, he, he observed that uh, emojis are made out of text also. It, or, you know, they're just SVG files. And SVG files in general, they're, they're text. And so he produced fake fake emojis, right? So these are all just like trained off a database of real emojis. And he also trained it on Arrowwood. Who knows what Arrowwood is? Yeah, <laughs> so self-incriminating, isn't it? No, no, just kidding. Um, Arrowwood is a website that compiles people's like written experiences with drugs. So people say like like, and there, you can scrape Arrowwood, and there's just tons and tons of like stories that people say. It, their experience with different drugs and so this is like you know <laughs> so i also saw some sort of manic shaman in the face of the spirit of a space which was pumping and clearly shaking and dancing around the room i felt as if i was on the couch and the real world was being pulled at me the sensation was still very clear the surface was obviously intense and not a dream i felt like i was going to end that i didn't have a hold of me i was still awake to the realm of reality yeah yeah 
We should pull up, um, air, go on Twitter and search for Airwood Recruiter. Oh my god, I think I saw that, like... It's, it's not RNM's, like, Markov chain, because it's older than that. But it's, it was trained on a combination of Airwood diary and tech recruiter emails. <laughs> Moaning, holding ourselves to quell the inner pain. We are experiencing incredible growth. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Culture. We are looking for someone that can last over 24 hours. A team that's working to directly and tangibly change the world. Hell. Hi, Kevin. Your name surfaced in several of these green blocks. <laughs> Equity is a pro-sexual drug. <laughs> Unbearable shame, public embarrassment. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, Ted, this is trained on Ted speeches. Uh, this is made by Samim. The real problem with the death for the universe. So, so every every joke was the same. It was like this. This thing is a funny version of the thing it's trained on, kind of. Um, but but you could do like really creative things. So this this guy, um, Adam Gategay, he trained he made he represented. You could build your own Super Mario levels as a sequence of you know objects. And so he trained. So this isn't RNN anymore, but it, um, trained an RNN to produce his own Mario levels. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. Um, Janelle Shane, who's who's that has done a bunch of these um, with uh, LSTMs. These are tr these are inventing ice cream flavors, bloody coffee, and then I guess she made her own drawings of it. Bug, pumpkin trash break, brown crunch, mango cats. <laughs> uh, RNL, uh, uh, um, April Fool's pranks. Place a pair of pants and shoes in your ice dispenser. Try using old clothes to pee. Glue all the eggs in the hubcaps of someone's computer. Um, Lexiconjure, this is like a, this was made by Ross Goodwin, who was a, who was a student here, um, I think maybe five years ago or something like that. He made a, um, it makes up a diction, it's dictionary entries. So it, make, it like makes up a new word and then makes up a definition for it. So Ratibiard. Giving the ratio of the sun and the horizon and the ratio of a limited state about the same type or condition, the rat, the rat river. Um, and he also made this movie called Sunspring. So this was really big. Um, he, they got the guy from, uh, what's, what's that show? Silicon Valley. Um, to Has anyone ever seen this? It's like science fiction. And, and then they actually had actors interpret it. So um, lots of stuff. And then you could do, but then you could do like more maybe dynamic stuff where, so this guy, Robin Sloan, who's like a, like a best-selling author, he, he wrote, uh, I don't remember the book, uh, but he, he made like a version of Adam, which uses char RNN to complete his sentences. And actually the ML5 examples, um, ML5 has an example like this too, I think. Take us home, she said to the nav computer. The computer said, keep out of the way, Jenny. Um, so there are some implementations online, char and um, you know, they're, they're, and actually M ML5 is really the easiest by now. Um, ML5 has a char and implementation that works pretty well. Sequence to sequence, so that's language translation. Another cool thing you can do with RNNs, and I want to, let's see how we do. It's like, uh, I want to get through most of, uh, it's 409, so 350, okay. So uh, this is really cool. We can, we can, we can maybe look at this a little bit. Um, David Ha, Hard Maru on Twitter, really popular ML guy. He trained a, um, so Google had this thing called QuickDraw, which is uh, like a, it's a gigantic data set, which is now publicly available. You can download it of, of doodles, like sketches that people drew of all sorts of things. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, I think they had like a thousand categories. And so um, David trained a, um, like a, you know, a sketch, a sketching RNN, right? Because that's a sequence of pen strokes in a, in a certain direction, right? And so um, then they showed how they could do all sorts of stuff with it. This is actually the, the, the architecture. It's not for the faint of heart, but basically it's kind of like a, this is so, it's sort of like a combination of an RNN plus an autoencoder. 
right? So the whole idea, the, the way that this is, works is that you have an RNN, which generates a, a latent rep representation, and then the re latent rep representation is supposed to generate the same, uh, uh, the same output as the input, like the sketch. And so it's kind of like a, more or less like trying to learn a latent space for, for sketches. And then with that latent space, you can do the same kinds of tricks that we showed in the generative models chapter. So you could do things like this. So, okay, so you would draw something like a, like a cat, right? And then, okay, so th this was a few, of th this shows the reconstruction, right? So basically you draw this, that goes into the input, and then it comes out as the reconstruction. The reconstruction doesn't look exactly like the input, but it's roughly the same shape, right? So that's those. But then if you try to um, make something like a cat with three eyes, it'll give you a cat with two eyes. So it learns like to, it, it learns a proper embedding that got, gets rid of noise. And actually autoencoders are supposed to do this. They're supposed to get rid of noise. Um, and then like if you make, it's trained on cats. So if you put in a toothbrush, It'll just make sort of like a toothbrush looking cat, you know? Um, yeah. And then there's a, you know, you can make two inputs and then, then encode them into, into the latent space and then do an interpolation uh, between those two latent codes and then get this interpolation between, you know, a cat of a uh, face of a cat and, you know, uh, a sort of pig. <laughs> um, yeah, this just shows like a pig turning into a, well, another kind of pig, I guess. Um, you could do arithmetic, right? So this is like, the, remember the whole like man plus king minus queen, what is it? Uh, no, man. <laughs> yeah, sunglasses, let's use that instead. So this is like, you know, cat face plus pig body minus pig face equals cat body, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can do this kind of arithmetic. Huh, sorry? Pig body, cat face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pig body, cat face. Uh, I don't know. So this is like that. You got the idea. Oh, then the latent space of yoga. This is great. These are all yoga positions. And are these from people's sketches of yoga? or? Is yeah. Yeah, yeah. It comes okay. from Quick Draw. There's a nice little lotus. Because I feel like it would also be interesting if there was a database of images of yoga poses, because then you could use like PoseNet to get the poses and then turn them into sketches. You could do that, yeah. Yeah, you, that, that's certainly something you could do. Or you could just go to the Quick quick Draw and download like however, I don't know how many yoga drawings they have. Um, then he also, before he had made SketchArn and he had done uh, like a, a an earlier version of this with, um, with basically a data set of SVGs of Chinese characters. So then, and then, and then the thing is, he just trained it unconditioned, and so it would generate basically fake characters. So you know, don't try to read this because, well, it's kind of it's kind of cool, right? Like <laughs> none of these mean anything apparently. Um, but but the, and then he made this uh, Neo Kanji. Uh, there still should be like a Twitter account, I think, on of Neo Kanji. Woodpecker food. Fire release. Oh, this is new, actually. He has, like, now it's painted. Yeah, I don't think it used to be like that. I think that must have been added re more recently. I don't know. What did he use to use it? What's that? What, what did he use? Oh, it's basically like a precursor to, to Neo Kanji. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a precursor to Sketch on and then yeah. trained on. Yeah, and he has, a, he has a blog post about it. Um, and also, uh, he has in Colab a demo of Sketch RNN. This is really easy to use. Um, you can you can definitely check this out. So, Sketch RNN. This lets you do basically the stuff that they put into the notebook. So, if you follow this, this generates a sheep. Uh, this is trained in Aaron Koblen's data set of sheep that they used for that project. Um, what was it called? Uh, sheep market. Yeah. Um, so doing interpolations between different sheeps. <coughs> then they have flamingos also. So lots of lots of neat stuff. 
Um, handwriting is a form of sketch RNN. In some sense. I mean, it's not sketch RNN, but th this is actually like a, the really the the early. This is really early. Adam a Alex Graves, who's one of the kind of one of the people who really really got <laughs> RNNs to work the way they do, especially on sequences. Uh, sorry, like like you know sketch uh, sketch sequences. Let's say so they were able to model handwriting. Um, yeah, then this is not really connected to RNNs, so I don't know why I have this here, but this is something cool that has to do with language, so <laughs> hierarchical story generation. So this was really cool because this um, was the first time I saw, maybe this is already a year or two ago, and uh, there is code for this. It basically was trained on a Reddit channel called Writing Prompts. So this is a channel where people, where basically you there's a, some some writing prompt the scientists have discovered something terrible and then and then somebody i guess has to write us like a par a few paragraphs about that prompt and so they scraped all of the all of it all of that reddit channel and generated a little bot that writes set uh, that writes stories from prompts so the scientists have discovered something terrible and then this this is machine generated the scientist stood there a little dazed as he stared what is it he asked this 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 thing this is a virus, a chemical that can destroy the entire planet and it is a very small, complex chemical that could destroy any planet, the scientist replied. His, his lab assistant looked down at the tablet. So that was pretty cool. That was actually, like I think, the most coherent I think I saw before GPT-2, which we will get to. Um, attention is something cool. I'll go if, I'll, I'm actually making good time. We're almost... Uh, we'll, get, we'll get through most of the language stuff before, before our break. I wanted to mention... I think we won't really cover this because um, maybe it's beyond their scope, but there's a, a really interesting mechanism called attention, which kind of is is how an RNN can... So, so like, let's say in the context of language translation, you know, when you're doing sequence to sequence, when you're, when you're translating language in your head, you're kind of focusing on one part of a sentence to translate it, you know... Um, to, to translate a segment of it, right? And so the, there's this, there's a, attention is this way of doing, uh, of this way of neural networks doing that, basically. And there's actually a really nice blog post, again, by Chris Ola, I think he wrote it, on distill.pub, which is a really great, like, uh, like sort of blog uh, that writes really, really, like, really beautiful articles about, about machine learning with nice graphics and stuff like this, where they described how attention works and then also talked about neural Turing machines. And neural Turing machines, um, Neural Turing machines never really, it does, I feel like they kind of died, but they, they were uh, an attempt to use RNNs to, um, w with something that was supposed to kind of resemble uh, RAM, you know, like random access memory. And so if you can make an RNN that has RAM, it's already a processor. If it also has RAM, it's like a computer. And so it can write programs, right? And programs have RAM and they have instructions. And so they, they um, I think in the early version of it, they demonstrated how to do something like they trained a, a RNN to do copy, to write a program that does copy paste, you know, so like, like that's a, a baby computer learning how to write programs. Um, and so if that ever gets off the ground, it's like, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the singularity right there. Draw it. This is... There's just a lot of stuff. This is actually quite old now, so I feel like some of these slides I really need to <laughs> to renovate. Um, and yeah, I it's the same thing, right? Oh, it's the same thing, yeah. Uh, just the same articles about augmented RNNs. Okay, so <laughs> the thing is that um, char RNN was all the rage four years ago, and now it's all about GPT-2, right? And I probably already mentioned GPT-2. If you had shown me in my 2016 class what we'd be doing with language models like even then i would have been like no way it's just not ready and uh gpt2 is like is really crazy so th this will be this should be the last thing we do maybe before we take the break uh let me let me just mention a few things about gpt2 and then we'll do a fun demo with it so uh gpt2 uses what are called transformers i'm not going to get into the details of it because I, I haven't actually read it <laughs> It's one of the things on my agenda. Uh, transformers are related to attention, so they use attention as a mechanism. Um, but in any case, they, they make extremely coherent text. And so when OpenAI first did this, this was maybe, I think by now, it was close to a year ago, if not more. Um, they they uh, published this blog post where they showed 
that they can train um, these transformers to make unbelievably coherent text. Um, this was the blog post they wrote where they, they showed a whole bunch of examples of this. So if you look like, uh, did I show this at some point in this class? No. So this was, they, they used, they showed these examples. So when was this written actually? It was written February. Okay, so it wasn't even a year ago. They basically uh, showed samples. So this was also prompt versus sentence completion, basically, or, or prompt completion. So the system prompt, human written. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. The scientists named the, and then this is what the model writes, the scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. And if you read this, it like, it, it's pretty convincing, right? Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and several companions were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noticed that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. So uh, in any case, initially they didn't release the model because they were like, this is going to be the beginning of fake news and everything. And so they wanted to, their, their justification was they wanted uh, you know, defensive resources to have time to catch up. And uh, so they began to kind of do these stage releases where they released a small model, which was kind of like a bad version of it. And then they released a middle, mid, middle sized one and then a the half sized one. And then just like three weeks ago, I think they released the biggest one. They released the one that this, that, that was, that the blog post is based on. And there's actually a, um, there is a, a website called talk to transformer, which, um, which lets you, which lets us use it. So let's, let's try it out. So this is what I wrote earlier today. The interactive telecommunications program, ITP at NYU is the largest entrepreneurial incubator in the country. The initiative was founded in 2011 and is growing quickly. A full set of press and educational materials for it, for the ITP can be found here. Check out one of their ex exhibits and read some stories from entrepreneurs who have used the ITP to help them grow their business. So let's, uh, and also it's on runway also, um, and you'll be able to retrain them soon. So you can, you can fine tune these to a different data set, just like with Char and N. So, um, yeah, is, like, I think so. Uh, pretty sure. I don't think it's available yet. Uh, uh, at least it wasn't last time I checked, which was like two days ago. Uh, but that, that it's in the coming uh, training is available for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did anybody try to try train style again? Right. On the, okay. Well, anyway, that's available to you. And then, then, uh, let's, let's try it out. Okay. Who, who wants to come up with, uh, you know, some, yeah. Oh, oh no, no. who has who wants to make a prompt? Let's let's go off the board. Somebody. Shall we do one of those like everyone says a word again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, starting here. First word. Why? Why? <laughs> R. R. Winter. Winter. Winters maybe or Winters. Yeah. Winters. So. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Long. You, what? Long. Long. Hair. Hair. All right, this isn't making any sense. I think you have Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, right, right. Right, right. right. Let, let's, let's, okay, how about this? Let's do uh, a test. We'll do, like, we'll look at the New York Times. And let's pick out bleed. Oh no, I don't want to. You say why are winters so long? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Why are winters so long? Why are winters so cold? Why don't sea whales migrate? Why is it so hard to find a new home? Why are the Canadian provinces with the highest population density in the world? Why are hockey players able to get paid more than others? Why don't bats fly? A little bit. Yeah. Okay, how about this? In a nation of one point, White House invited to participate in an impeachment hearing. Oh, let's do this. It'll be, it'll, it's really good at news. 
Obama asked to come to D.C. for impeachment hearing. Fox News' Brett Baer reports the Republican majority in the House will hold a hearing on Tuesday, th Thursday on the matter of alleged Russian meddling in last year's election and possible connections with Trump aides. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest said Tuesday, I'm sure President Trump will be joining the process on a number of occasions to push back on these outlandish and insulting theories that have been peddled about the president, Earnest said. Did it just make that up? Totally. It's all, this is all generated. Did it just make this up? Going by our talking points, the reason, oh, maybe it's conditioned also, so it keeps on, let's, let's get it off track. Um, Depending on the names <laughs> that you use. Pike and I were using this, and then when he used Pike, it started in the mention of a story yeah. about him and a Russian woman. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's great <laughs> stuff. Um, oh, what's something clever we could do with this? Like, if you say something biblical, it usually takes like a different choice to like find it. <laughs> because you are not just talking about Christianity, you're also talking about Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. Then there's a seemingly trivial issue of if there is an afterlife and if I go to heaven or hell. Those issues are not only peripheral to Christianity, they are nearly essential to Christianity. The link with God, eternity, and happiness permeates every aspect of our lives. The notion that you can, and I think you can do like even different languages and it'll pick up some, you know, like. Um, Huh? I tried, I tried yeah. Spanish, Spanish. Vamos a la biblioteca <laughs> y la playa. Did I spell it right? <laughs> oh, it's just switched back to English. But translated. Yeah. Let's do it again. Oh, look, he gave us it. <laughs> Let's see if this goes anywhere. Oh, this this might be the worst thing ever. I hope it, it's yeah. probably it's probably fake. But I just put in something yeah. about Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> I just put in something about Cinderella and it switched to Harry Potter. Oh yeah. Yeah. I said like Cinderella Johnson. Oh look, it's got some Spanish here. Oh, it's a it's a tweet. That's what it is. It's a tweet. <laughs> Ultimos trabajos. Um, so you get the idea. Um, it's also in Runway, so you could do the same exact thing that we were just doing in Toxic Transformer in Runway. And in the training, let's see if it's available yet. I, probably, um, I think it's it's not available yet. Um, runway. So if you go to the training tab, not available yet, but unless it's in the new update. So let's just see if it. Here's nine point. Yeah, but it's just as coming soon. So let's try and launch it again. Anyway, um, oh, and I just want to mention a little story about this. Like, like shortly after they released it, a few months later, this this like college kid in Munich claimed that he had retrained it and he was going to release the model by himself, and then and then he didn't. And I think I think uh, because OpenAI called him and he's like, my beliefs have been changed. And I, I feel like, and then he wrote this really, he wrote this whole like rambling manifesto about why he chose to, <laughs> why he wanted to release it. And then he wrote another manifesto about why he didn't. And I just think OpenAI totally paid him off. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, um, he, he put up a bunch of uh, like, it, 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 lo it looked pretty believable, just, just what he wrote in his text. Uh, it's not impossible because the code was released at least. It's just that the data set wasn't. And so he kind of re retraced their steps. Um, oh, wow. Okay, yeah, this is already. But I don't think. Uh, this is actually a whole new. Um, oh, we're in 0 0.10. Look at that. Uh, it doesn't look like. This is the training. Oh, okay, yeah, so create. No, this is still just uh Yeah, I think I, I think it did. Because I was looking at this first one earlier today. Because I think that's what's saying right there is upcoming. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. There, there's no GPT yet, but um, but it's coming. So, yeah, a little showcase. It's my buddy Andreas. Okay, um, let's see. So it's 4.30. How about... Uh, so, yeah, we're getting up to NLP stuff. So basically what I'll do is I'll call it uh, first half. And then we'll come back and we'll do... NLP and audio, I'm just barraging you with stuff. Sorry, today is, you know, it's a little bit cruel to just like blast you with two and a half hours of lectures, but you got to see this stuff. Um, and um, so, yeah, let's take a quick break. And then um, should we do the evaluation? I'll, I'll, how about this? We'll like end class early, like 10 minutes early and I'll just leave. <laughs> and then because I'm supposed to leave and then you guys do the evaluation. So we'll take a quick break and I'll you know, be back here in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it seven and a half minutes. Seven and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's get back to it. Man, I'm really stuffy. It's like, it's getting to be a problem. What's going on? Uh, a defective nose, basically. Just kind of. Anyway, um, so if, I, if, I'm, if I'm really gross, like, please don't, don't hold it against me. Okay. Um, it's getting worse all day. So language models, what can they do? Uh, let's just kind of like go over some of the cool things that language models do. They can generate articles as we've seen. They can do, but but then they can also do more useful things, right? So the novelty of, of GPT-2 is that it generates really coherent text, but what are the use cases? What are the applications of that? So depending on how something like GPT-2 is trained, it can be trained to do various language related tasks so you, you can have personal assistance so imagine in the future that you'll have your phone and you'll be like you'll have a little friend you know you'll be like you know hey android like uh you know talk to me you know, tell me tell me how what's going on today like tell me the news blah 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 like you know you'll be able to have a little friend to talk to so this is the future we all you know instead of having human friends we'll like just have a bunch of you know apps and actually, there's like already apps that are doing this. There's one, I forget what it's called. Does someone know Rep Replicant, right? Is that like some That's iPhone app? Huh? Yeah, really? Like the Blade Yeah, I think so. Wait, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Like there is, a, there is some sort of, you know, friend app that's out there. I don't, is it called Rep Replica or Replicant? Something like that. I don't know. You know, think of her, right? Think of that movie, Her, right? So then um, fake social media, news, fake news, product reviews, and so on. People are all freaking out over fake news. I actually don't think it's that big of a deal, personally. That's just me. Um, and I can explain that, but that's, that's out of context. So then uh, impersonating people, you know, so that's your, that's your, deep, uh, your deep fakes, but also with language. Um, make books and make uh, oh, lyri I spell lyrics wrong actually that's a Freudian slip because that lyric with a K is actually something else, it's a machine that I really like, anyway um, move, make, make whole movies like imagine making the scripts to movies so all of that stuff is it seems to be on its way okay so that brings us to natural language processing right? Um, NLP so this is kind of a this is this is a little bit of a um, a switch away from language models per se and get into some applications of of a field called natural language processing, which has been around for a long time. So NLP is sort of like um, a field dedicated to studying text, so that it can so that the the idea is to perform useful text related text to, uh, tasks. So like some simple ones are things like spell checking, you know, spell checking, uh, maybe next sentence, uh, next word prediction, translation, um, some information re retrieval tasks like sentiment analysis and predicting, you know, like picking out parts of speech or something like that, different, different kinds of things that might be useful for, um, well, for various higher level tasks. Uh, automatic summarization, you know, content, content generation, um, then things like also like spam filtering, detecting, classifying um, emails into spam, making question and answering services, chatbots and duplexes and so on. A lot of a uh, lot of really cool stuff. NLP it turns out to be a lot harder than it looks, you know, and that's because there's so much ambiguity and cultural baggage tied into language that it's really hard for you know machines to capture that. So here's a nice example that that Jeffrey Hinton uses sometimes. Here's two sentences. 
the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too big. And, and then, so what does it refer to? The trophy, right? How about the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too small? So what does it refer to, right? So we, we take for granted, it's the suitcase, right? So we take for granted how much ambiguity is in language that you know uh, uh, that you really have to understand the meaning of a sentence before you even understand the meaning of the words and of course you have to understand the meaning of the words to understand the meaning of the sentence so it's a little bit of like a circular problem that makes a lot of just you know natural language processing tasks very difficult and um and that's be and, and this is kind of a general property of language. This is not a language class per se, so I don't want to go too far into linguistics, although it's a, it's a pet interest of mine. But uh, connotation is really like the big, the sort of elephant in the room. We we underestimate. We don't we don't realize how much uh, connotation plays a uh, a role uh, in our understanding of what people say because you can use you can have two words that mean basically the exact same thing but one has a positive valence to it and one has a negative valence to it and then they completely change the intent of the sentence. And so those are all things that are really, really difficult for, for um, you know, machine learning systems to pick up on. But they're becoming better. Um, so we've hinted at this already. So the idea of words being embedded into space. So this is kind of going in, uh, we're gonna cover that in a little bit more closely. So um, remember how in the early weeks of this class, we talked about how images get embedded into feature vectors, right? So for example, you know, you can project this down, uh, you can project, you can project an image into a feature vector, which then you use for various sort of downstream tasks. You know, maybe this is what you input into the recurrent neural network in order to generate some text, or maybe you use it in a classifier, or, you know, you use it in your, um, you know, uh, like a Covnet predictor, Covnet OSC, that, that type of stuff, that's what's happening here. So ideally, we'd like to be able to do the same thing with words as well. So we want to get a word vector associated with a word. And two words that are similar in some sense of the word similar should have a similar feature vector. And, and what it means for words to be similar is a little ambiguous as well. So that's kind of tied to the task. Um, so, uh, so, so word embeddings give us relationships between words in the form of, of um, like vectors is between them. So if you were to embed words in a feature space, you'd like to be able to pick out relationships like, uh, you know, things that change words in certain ways. So for example, um, you know, and as we saw with images, right, you can, you can add the smile vector to an image, to a face to get the same face smiling, or you can add the age vector to get the same age, to get the same face with a different age, right? So maybe in the word embedding, there might be a part of speech vector that might change like a past tense vector that changes a verb into its past tense. Or maybe um, there might be a country capital vector, a vector that takes a, a word and then if you go in a certain direction, you find that the, uh, sorry, it takes a country and if you go in a certain direction, you get its capital, things like that. And then if you have that, then you have sort of a big, a big sort of knowledge, what's called a knowledge graph. And actually a knowledge graph is something more specific. Knowledge graph is kind of the generalization of this to, or not a generalization, but a specific case of this, which is, which embeds knowledge relationships between things in a big space, you know, sort of, so that's a super interesting area as well that we won't go into. Um, and so, yeah, like if you were to do this with images, you find that similar images, like these two dogs are located close to each other. Uh, if you do it with sounds, similar sounds are close to each other. And if you do it with words, the same thing would happen. I'm going to skip, you know, like this is kind of how, so I, I'll just mention really quickly how, how are word vectors derived? So the way that they're derived is actually, um, is actually, um, well, I, I shouldn't say it's straight. I was going to say straightforward, but it's not straightforward, but, but it's, um, it, it's basically they're derived in uh, in the process of doing some language task, like for example, predicting the next word, right? So the, these are both different versions of of models which attempt to predict words in some context. So this one predicts uh, like uh, what is I forget how SIBO is like. Uh, it's uh, 
it's a predicting a context. Like I think this is just the next word after a sequence of three, and then skip gram. I've actually forgotten the difference between skip gram and cbal. It doesn't matter. The point is like uh, depending uh, it, you you can train it to some particular task, and then it learns word vectors that are useful for uh, for that task. And usually they're quite similar to the same word vectors that you would find in training to, towards almost any task. Um, and you'll find things like this. So here's a there's like a gender vector. There's a a, past te a verb tense vector, a country capital vector. And in if your dimension the dimensionality is high enough, this is it's you know it's 3D for depictions purpose depiction purposes, but it's usually much more. Then uh, you can get a lot of different kinds of relationship vectors in that space. Right. So like you know woman to man, king queen to king. So where would duchess be? So that just would be up there, right? So it makes sense. Um, ML5 has a good word to vec, some good word to vec functionality. So you can do things like uh, finding groups of related words or find the word in between two words. It's kind of these kinds of tasks. So if you're interested in language stuff, ML5 is, a, is actually really, really solid for that. Um, and ideally you'd be able to do this for sentences too. So for example, is there a question answer vector? So this inverts a question and turns it into an answer. The hardware store is in Queens. Where is the hardware store? The mouse ate the cheese. What did the mouse eat? Right. So <coughs> in principle, a sentence, thank you, a sentence coder should do something like this as well. Skip dot vectors. So let's let's take a look at this. Actually, this is really nice because there is a uh, collab for the universal sentence encoder, which was released by... <coughs> excuse me, uh, by, by Google, by TensorFlow. So they have this sentence encoder, which, um, which for, so if we, if we go through this notebook, I'll do it really quickly. Um, we can measure how similar two sentences are. So if I just go through all of these, I'll show it really, I'll show it to you really quick. Um, what's going on here? Sorry. Um, semantic textual similarity so this basically yeah here's the similarity here's where I want to get to so for example we can do something like you know message one we can measure the similarity between two sentences right so for example message one equals um, the cheese is in the grocery store message two equals there is food in the i don't know in the butcher shop message three i am going to the movies which of these two sentences are the most similar yeah right right so maybe we can actually do this this idea where we can oh let's see if i remember how to do this really so there's like a and it, oh yeah we have to get the so basically you get the embedding like this run embed messages so we'll quickly messages equals where it's sent so we can get an embedding for these which is going to be a huge feature vector containing these three messages. So message one, message two, message three. Um, so let's run that. And then, so this, once that's finished, we'll, we'll have three of these. Um, display this. Right, so there's three of these. So we can measure the different the like distance between one and the other. So what's one way of doing that? So like let's take message embedding zero, message embedding one. Uh, we'll we'll do this thing where we basically take the difference between them, and we take the mean squared error. So this is going to be the sum of this the squared errors between one and two. That's that. And then, uh, so like print the difference between one and two, the first sentence and the second sentence, the difference between the first sentence and the third sentence, 
and the difference between the second and the third. So if our if we were correct, the first and the second should. Uh, oops, what did I do? Three. Oh, of course not. Yeah. Two, two, one. So if we are correct, the, this one should have a small distance, 1.07. Then the other two have big distance, 1.7, 1.88. So you can do this, uh, measure the similarity of two sentences. So, okay, that could be pretty useful for a lot of things. Like maybe you can, you can figure out what fairy tales are very similar to each other. So Itai um, did this kind of a project last year. Or uh, you can do something like, uh, like let's say you start with two sentences and you, let's say you've analyzed a huge data set of, of sentences and then you pick two sentences and then you draw a line between them and you try to find a, um, like a path through your sentence space uh, of like a, you know, uh, sort of like the nearest sentence to this point if we had enough time, we could do it. We could, we could probably do something like this. Like if we, it might be a, it, it might be too much like a <laughs> struggle to, to put into a lecture, but uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, would you, if you were like tracing that path, would there be like nonsense words or sentences along the way? Like, Oh, I, what I meant was you would analyze a bunch of actual sentences, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, maybe from Wikipedia or something. And then you could like take all your candidate sentences and then try to find sentences that follow a path. And all the ones that you would find would have been from that original Yeah, database. yeah, yeah. Well, like I'm doing some sort of a nearest neighbor lookup or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, now, if you had something that generates uh, sentences, um, so, you know, like a language model that generates sentences from, uh, from uh, encoding, you know, so like some GPT-2 should do that. Then maybe you can even generate sentences <laughs> along a certain path. So, uh, and people have done stuff like this. I don't remember, I don't know anything offhand. It's like, um, I don't know anything offhand, but there, there's definitely, there's the good examples of this. You all right? <laughs> how old are you what is your age so how are they placed in the graph is that latent space the latent space is you know is what is the encoding so yeah i'm sorry i, I didn't really like look at these uh, so like message embeddings if you look at this yeah. it's like one of them like the first one for example looks like this and it's just a big vector i think it's 512 elements probably mm -hmm. so let's look at the shape you know it's 512 elements so each of these are a 512 dimensional vector <coughs> and so we can we can look at the you know how close they are to each other can you ever do 3d vectors uh can can you yeah so i mean sure uh this is the uh, sentence encoder does does the 512 because uh, if you condense everything to three, you might not capture enough of the meaning. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. You could also do like a Tsni or something. Yeah, that's. You could totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You could just run Tsni on the messenger embeddings. So that's definitely a, a very good, a very good one. And actually, I'll have a slide about something that's similar to that. So yeah, the, I've already shown this text to attention again. Some of these are a little repetitive. I'm sorry about that. Oh, there's a really cool poetry generation thing that was done. Actually, this is my my advisor in college way back in the day, Cynthia Rudin. She's my when I first did, started doing machine learning stuff. And so she's actually at Durham now at Duke, and some of her students made this like really cool um, machine generated sonnets. Um, the man whose name I do not know, the earth and of a woman to lament. I see that you are in the Eastern game. To me, the odor of his hat and scent, it even rhymes. I think they made it rhyme, which is really cool. So if you want to look at some poetry generation, that's a good one. This is a really cool project that I, that I saw from Stanford like a little while ago, the NLP lab over there, where they, where they did word vectors and compared how, wor like if you do word vectors using text only from particular time periods, you can see how different words shift over time. So like a notable example is the word gay. 
So in, in, the, in the early 1900s, gay meant something like happy, you know, like you could read it in, you know, Mark Twain or something like that. And um, obviously means something different today. And so you can kind of trace the, the evolution of different words. Um, there, and it's really neat because there's a lot of words that, that have shifted a lot over time and we don't even realize, like the word awful um, meant... So yeah, meant because because if you look at the word off, awful now means terrible, you know something really bad, right? But awful, if you look at the word, it means full of awe. You know, it's like full of awe should it, well yeah, majestic. It used to mean something more like what majestic meant. Um, and what else? There's really good examples of this, like. Uh, I think awesome also meant something awesome meant I feel like awesome and awful switched mm -hmm. is that what happened yeah awesome used to mean terrible now now awful means terrible so go figure right broadcast right so yeah the word broadcast now it means something with radio right but the word but broadcast was around in the 1850s and to broadcast actually meant to scatter seeds so it's really really funny um language translation i already mentioned okay so then i just have to mention this because it's because it's it's a good example of um press uh you know like doing everything wrong so um a little while ago uh there was some work by facebook research facebook has a really really strong ai lab as you might imagine and they uh observed that language translation is a, is a hard problem right obviously um and, and we want to do it better. Facebook obviously wants to be able to do language translation really well. And the way that language translation generally works is using these sequence to sequence models. So here's how it works. If you want to do French to English translation, you, um, you get a parallel database of French and English text. So you, know, you have sentence one in French, sentence one in English, sentence two in French, sentence two in English. And then you train sequence. You train a, a a recurrent neural network to do the to do the English sequence, the French sequence, or vice versa. So you do this for every single pair of languages, and you can do language translation, right? Well, um, obviously, this is hard because you have uh, so many different language pairs, and it's not like you know there's some database of uh, you know Swahili to Punjabi laying around somewhere that someone compiled a while ago. It's like it's really hard to get gigantic parallel data sets. And so they figured out that maybe there's a better way to do language translation by looking at how the word vectors are distributed. So the, 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 uh, um, the thesis is this. Imagine you did these, this word vectorization, you know, because word vectors don't require uh, like a labeled data set. You just need a huge amount of French text, let's say, if you want to embed French words in a, in a word to vec space and you need a huge amount of English to do the same thing with English, right? And so, oh, this is Spanish. Okay. So if you have Spanish and English, you observe the word vectors in English and you observe the word vectors in Spanish and, you know, you can probably figure out some kind of a perfect rotation that maps, you know, the, the Spanish onto the, uh, onto the English and vice versa, right? So what they, you know, so this is kind of how you do this rotation, and that's a way. That's also another way to do to do translation. You find nearest neighbors, and you go, okay, gato, cat, right? So you can do tra at least word to word translation that way. So, um, so who yeah. Who draws that shape? Sorry. Who draws the shape? Who draws how do you, it? How what do you mean? You decide on the shape. Like oh, I mean, it's just tra it, it just emerges from the training process. Okay. Like word vectors emerge in order to you know fulfill the task. So now, so here's the cool thing. Now imagine you take a thousand languages, or or I don't know, however many you have a lot of text for, and you do word vectors for all of them. Then you might get something like this for all of the all all of the um, languages, and you can figure out some. You can basically take all of these and rotate all of them into some one kind of neutral word sp word to vec space. You know that all of them are, are are rotated from. There's like a projection matrix that rotates all of these different um, in, rotates into all of these different languages, right? And so if you do that, you can do arbitrary language A to language B translation. So the, so 
That's what they did. And they figured out like multilingual unsupervised or supervised word embeddings, right? So then you can do things like language translation or, uh, you know, maybe word translation and so on uh, without needing parallel texts, right? Using this kind of neutral embedding space, right? So this is the, that was what they wrote in the articles. And then of course, like the press wrote Facebook's AI shuts down after they start talking to each other in their own language. AI is inventing languages humans can't understand. Bots are learning to chat in their own language. Facebook AI creates its own language and creepy preview of our potential future. So this just shows you like just how like everything that, you know, like if you hear an article about AI, it's usually some, you know, sort of sensationalist kind of clickbaity, you know, version of what's actually in the research. So Facebook AI invents its own language uh, nonsense. So just a funny thing. Uh, I also want to mention really quickly so that yeah, you can do TSNI on languages, right? So, or, or sorry, on text. Um, we did TSNI earlier. I, th I don't know if I remember showing you this, but we did TSNI on audio and images, right? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I showed that. Mm -hmm. And so you could do it on languages too. You know, like, okay, you, you, you can, um, uh, there's a bunch of ways of doing this. So, okay, using the sentence encoder is actually one way of doing it. You just get those embeddings and then you run TSNI on them. Uh, this was done differently. And you can find the code here online. I'm thinking about maybe porting it to Colab. That might might actually be a nice, nice thing. Um, the so what what's going on here is that um, I downloaded a whole bunch of Wikipedia articles that were all linked to from a Wikipedia list of political ideologies, and then um, you can do TSNI on uh, through a feature vector extracted from each article. And the feature vector was not actually a sentence embedding. That would be the that would be the deep learning way of doing it, which would be much better. I did an older, sort of more classical NLP way of doing it, which is kind of counting words and then their frequencies. Um, what, uh, the details are in are in this, but it, it should probably be updated with the sentence embeddings. I think that would work better. But in any case, like this is this is there and it's visualized in P5JS. So this is also something to to look at if you're interested in. Um, language embeddings. There's a whole bunch of um, like uh, Python NLP libraries. Um, this one, Spacey, is kind of the most modern. It seems to be really, really popular these days. I haven't used it that much, but Spacey is kind of like the deep learning NLP library. It's made by these people in Berlin. And I think Jensen does really good word to vac. I've, I've seen, you know, the, the NLTK is like super old school. This uh, like has been around for a really long time. Natural language processing library. Uh, so there's a lot of really, really good, like, and this is very high level. It's just like a few lines of Python code and you get word embeddings. You can do part of speech tagging really quickly. You can do uh, sentiment analysis. You can do, I'm not sure if they have translation, um, but basically a whole bunch of really good and really solid sort of classical NLP tasks. Are there any <clears throat> text generation? I, I think not in Spacey. Um, yeah, I think your GPT-2 is your, yeah. your salad. Like, nothing's going to beat that right now. Okay, so I want to do a really quick unit on audio uh, because um, we haven't really done audio in this class. And I've been, uh, this. I really enjoy sort of talking about this because it's kind of, it's one of my favorite subject areas. I started out doing audio stuff in machine learning. And uh, for me, like the iPod of the future is is kind of like, you know, something to both fear and revile, but also like maybe look forward to, we're gonna be able to do a lot of really cool things with audio. And audio is kind of lagging behind, you know, we've done, a, we have a lot of really great computer vision applications, image applications, and then audio kind of always lags behind, and as does text. And the reason for that is that it's just really hard to do stuff with sequences, um, you know, and there's time embedded into audio. You know, it's a sequence of samples or a sequence of words in, in the case of text. And so, Time is the great killer. It makes everything harder, but slowly, but slowly, but surely, we're able to kind of, uh, kind of figure it out. And so I'm gonna just try to speculate on certain things that you might expect to see in the future with, with um, you know, music. <clears throat> the first thing I just wanted to describe is like, yeah, I got my start and blah blah blah. I did some audio stuff back in the day. And I was involved in this field called music information retrieval, which is kind of all about using machine learning to extract information from audio 
So for example, you know, fingerprinting audio, detecting cover songs, maybe you record yourself humming a song, you know, or, or whistling it, and then you're able to um, query by that song, right? Um, and then, you know, doing things like classifying artists or classifying uh, genre, all of these kinds of things. Then audio stuff, the kind of stuff that you might see in Ableton Live, you know, beat tracking stuff, getting the key or the or or melody from from a piece of audio, source separation, you know, segmentation, things like this, um, genre tag classification, and so on, and then music recommendation systems, which was which was how I got, became interested in it. So this field has really taken a big step forward. Um, I want to skip some of this stuff. It's a little bit too maybe just a little bit too pedantic for us. Um, but but uh, actually, I did a um, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, but if you're interested in like the slides that I'm about to skip, I did, I did a um, ITP camp session with these slides uh, called Frontiers of Neural Art. Maybe some of you were even there. I don't know if any of you were there, where I described a little bit like some of this stuff. I'm gonna, but I'm. Gonna... Frontiers of what? Sorry, Frontiers, Frontiers of uh, if you you'll find it like it's on your website. yeah, it's on my website. So okay. <clears throat> if you go to to here the CV and you'll see like look up frontiers and I put the video here okay. um, but I'll, I'll kind of cover those like very briefly at least just so you get the gist of it um, so MIR depends on how you how you represent audio so you can represent audio in, in its waveform you can represent it in MIDI you can represent it in in symbolic form can any, anybody here read music nobody, nobody? Yeah. <laughs> um, and in the same way the computer vision was revolutionized by deep learning by getting rid of all the all the sort of the feature processing same thing has happened to audio so now you can just throw in just raw audio and get um, and you know do whatever task it is you're trying to learn back in the day when I started this this was like horrible this was just really like basically you would do all of this kind of you had to know a lot about signal processing right which is a completely different other field from machine learning. It's like uh, sampling uh, or getting features from signals, you know, so for example, extracting your, your um, you know, your Fourier transform to get all the frequencies to extract from that things like MFCCs, which is this representation of audio into perceptually meaningful frequency bins. And then there's all these musicological features, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff was, was uh, how you would represent audio and then plug in some shallow machine learning algorithm to to learn some task that you cared about like genre classification or something and um, now it's like you don't have to do any of that stuff which is which which makes it possible to basically treat computer audio the same way you treat computer vision it's practically unchanged which is why machine learning has taken over all of these different fields it's like you know machine learning does nlp you know, music information retrieval, computer vision, three completely different fields, completely different media, all done with deep learning in exactly the same way, pretty much um, because of this, uh, what, what we've done with feature extraction. And uh, yeah, uh, this is really, <laughs> I'm just going a little bit off the board here, right? Um, I don't know why I have this here. It's really cool. Right? This is the, I think this is a, the first recording of audio, someone recorded a um, a Blackfoot chief. So this is a like a Native American tribe <clears throat> singing into one of these gigantic gramophones, and then uh, we have recordings of this. So so to make sure this stuff doesn't get lost, um, and eventually that led to you know only fifty years later to electronic music. Um, bonus points for anyone who can name any of these people. Yeah, Pauline, I forget, yeah. Pauline Alvarez recently died, I think a year ago, maybe two years ago. Anybody else? Extra credit. Um, even if I remember. So this is, uh, uh, I, I think it's Zanakis uh, who did all sorts of, I might be wrong about that. And I think this is Pierre Schaefer. And then this is Daphne Oren, I think. So early people like working, like, you know, synthesizing, basically doing computer music. Uh, or this isn't really computer music, it's just electronic music, precursor to computer music. 
things like uh, music concrete. This is like a, an early electronic music. Uh, so before we had like, you know, pump up the techno kind of electronic music, we had people doing like weird space sounds. Like if you ever listen to Pierre Schaefer or something like that, it's just like weird space sounds, you know, in with completely aleatoric. There's no melody. There's no no rhythm it's just people experimenting with sound like because it used to be we take it for granted now but it used to be that the only sound that we could hear was sound that we could generate with um you know from recordings and so this completely changed the game like now you can synthesize sound you can synthesize any kind of sound and so that really kind of led to uh early electronic music i discovered recently that there was like a whole parallel track of this going on in japan also in the 19 you know 50s and 60s with some of these musicians um i don't know if anyone's acquainted with this but it's like early sort of japanese electronic music which is which um i don't know too much about except that it was sort of like like almost completely different like track and then eventually i think they kind of you know merge somewhere in the middle let's say Another bonus point question. Anyone ever been here or know where it is? It's not too far. This is the Columbia uh, It's called the Columbia Princeton Music Center. So this is actually where the Computer Music Center of Columbia University is. So I went to college here and this is where I kind of got into uh, MIR stuff. And in this building is the world's first ever um, mu a computer music synthesizer. So this is this is a bukla. It's made by this guy Don Bukla in the 19, uh, 1950s. and it's basically the world's first functioning synthesizer. And believe it or not, it still works. Uh, and they uh, it looks like a submarine, man. It's just this thing. This thing makes you know. It's got a bunch of like uh, you know knobs that create you know that that like send little signals to filters and then. There's even a sequencer, I think, like a primitive sequencer. And um, it's pretty, like, uh, it still works. Too. So these guys, uh, yeah, these are all really good guys. They uh, still get it out and play it once in a while. You know, making making weird beep boop sounds. It, um, the thing that it, it, what it does can now be fit into a, you know, a, a microscopic chip, basically. Like, like, that's what all of this does. And the first programmable music goes back to the 1960s. So this was the first recorded computer music composition. So, um, <laughs> so that, that what you just heard was the, I believe it was basically the first computer music pro the first programmed music ever. And it was made by this fellow right here who just died actually a couple of years ago. Who knows who this is? Anybody? So his name is Matt, Max Matthews. And um, he is the person who Max MSP is named after. So, so yeah, he just died two years ago. This guy, everyone loved him. He's just like the, this like super kind-hearted, you know, like person who loved making musical instruments. He, in the 1960s, he made the first, you know, programmable electronic music. And even until the like late 2010, or not late 2010, but maybe early 2010s, he was experimenting with instruments this is a really cool like mallet based electronic instrument that he invented really really um really really nice guy very popular so this kind of led to in the 80s and 90s what was happening by then was that computers had gotten so fast that you could program much more complicated physical models 
So for example, in a uh, guitar or some string instrument has a particular way that, it's, that it makes sound physically. You can model it with physics equations. And so if you can model it with physics equations, you can uh, simulate those equations and just generate the audio sample by sample so you can get stuff that sounds like guitar strings or violin strings or maybe a bassoon or drums or whatever. And uh, this was in, so w the thing is, of course, the equations were a little bit idealistic and so they didn't capture all of the complexities of those instruments and so they sounded a little bit sterile, right? So if you listen to the 80s or 90s, you know, your guitar string synthesized sounded very sterile. It didn't sound quite very, like, realistic. Um, but, um, but it was, you know, like it was kind of the beginning of what we were doing today. I got interested in this field like a few, uh, maybe like 10 years ago, and my friend was building these musical instruments. So we were hooking them up to electronic, uh, like, um, we were hooking them up to these digital instruments. I might have shown this in the first day at some point. Um, but, like, this is, like, uh, for example, yeah, this loudest playing this instrument. So the way it worked is that all of these sensor parameters are being mapped to synthesis parameters that control a Maximus P instrument. And so this is basically like the kind of stuff you can do with Wackenator, you know, basically mapping one interactive data into another kind of interactive data. Um, so yeah, then audio started, then deep learning started to become, begin to generate audio. So what's the difference between this and this? Is that this is all hand programmed. It's like a really, really complicated circuit that, that has a whole bunch of, uh, of like um, audio filters that have been programmed, you know, to obey the laws of physics. And then this is um, deep learning. Just take the audio, learn a model of sample by sample, and um, produce stuff that sounds like whatever it was trained on, right? So this is kind of when that first started to happen. Um, it's Coltrane. It sounds really good, but it's actually it's actually overfitting. Oh yeah. Um, WaveNets came along in 2016, and this was when the state of the art really rolled forward. pretty crazy right that you can do this kind of stuff um, and it's gotten a lot better since 2016 that sounds a little bit more coherent on a long-term scale um, and this just uses convolutional neural networks there's no RNN here um, the blog post explains how that works there was an open source version of this that was put online because WaveNet was never open sourced by, by uh, DeepMind and so you can you can actually go look there and um, as a joke, like when the when the original WaveNet post came out, they kind of showed how you can um, basically like produce speech, right? So the speech can be conditioned. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, seventeen seventy to eighteen fifty. Oh, that's the old version. That's, that's parametric, and then WaveNet sounds better. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, seventeen seventy to eighteen fifty. They also had it in Chinese. Right, and what's cool is they showed like okay, you can condition it on words, so you can have it guided to a particular word, so it can say something, or you can simply uh, just give it a whole bunch of uh, audio and have it learn, you know, so if you give it a bunch of audio of English and then don't tell it what the words are, it will learn to make sounds that sound kind of like English. So they let us cooperate. So again, they play learn our physical induction way. Is it today? Our parents did have to pick it up. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I think that I want to say they did this for Chinese too, but I don't know, maybe they didn't. So they're just Thai pictures of... No, it's just, it's just English. Um, as a joke, I think I think that was all they had. As a joke, I actually like... Um... 
So I, I recorded myself running through these. And then you know how Google, uh, like YouTube has... Um, so it does closed captioning, right? So this is YouTube's automatic closed captioning. I just ate them. They'll be says this. There's a lot of work for Caden to be challenged. But as an A, could that Jeffy River? It's all right to tell him to be the Zanot, are they? That I can't hunt. Hey. The two just to sit now, all very good. Shut it off, says. See it to tell us, guys. No man, boo. He has the hitching we've gained. So weird stuff like that. Um. Closed captioning. Uh, there was oh, there was also this uh, sample RNN, which is kind of similar, but it, but it uses it does use an RNN. And did anyone see this uh, relentless doppelganger? So this was uh, this guy CJ Carr uh, trained sample RNN, which is kind of like WaveNet on death metal, and then he made an infinite stream on YouTube. That's that's going on now still. Um, it's it's an oh, or actually no, they have it they have it here right. So this is an infinite YouTube stream of just generated death metal. This is live. You can come in at this this website at any time, and and it's just it's doing this, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, sorry? That's the, that's the future iPod, right? That it's like radio stations are just endless. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that, I'm going to get into that. Even, even, it's even worse than you think. <laughs> like it's, it's, so yeah, this was actually some updates on WaveNet last year. This is Sander Dilliman, who's, uh, who's at DeepMind, showing that even better piano now. minute-long piano sample so it's getting more and more coherent some kind of a melody to it uh, WaveNet is also the basis for this uh, n synth instrument which is basically um, magenta which is a division at Google doing you know AI and art experiments and they show that you can you can use something like WaveNet to synthesize instrument sounds and then you can do this kind of like let's say combining different kinds of instruments together so like bass plus flute you know, they, they have this, um, so close to sitar. Basically, change the timbre of the audio as you go. That's where they are right now. It's pretty awesome. Um, then there's been all this work on making MIDI from, uh, with LSTM so people could make like, uh, generate MIDI and that's another way of, of making audio. Um, I'll, I'll skip the link there or doing, or doing things like cycle again. Remember we looked at cycle again, except for MIDI. So, you know, you interpret MIDI as an image and then you turn classical into jazz. Right, so they would take MIDI of classical music and then do a sort of uh, style transfer and turn it into jazz or vice versa. So you'd get something like Mozart and then it would get all syncopated and kind of jazzy sounding. This is really awesome, Piano Genie. Piano Genie is basically, it's like sketch RNN. You know, it's like, in, it's a, it's a encoder type architecture that takes a sequence and encodes it into a smaller latent space. So like, let's say a sequence of notes on the piano embeds it into a smaller dimensional latent space 
and then uh, like through an autoencoder type architecture. And so then small codes give you complex melodies. And so then what can you do? You could turn it into Piano Genie. This is a really great project. Um, so here's the idea. Instead of playing piano, you have these little buttons and the buttons just produce crazy sound. Um, so. It always sounds good, no matter what you do. <laughs> Does anyone, does anyone know how to play piano? How do you feel that all of your yeah. years and years of practice and then like some, you know, dipshit like me comes along and like I'll put on the little, little toy that looks like it was made at, at like in the Walmart that you bought it off of like the, the shelf of Walmart. It probably cost like $5 and I'll just like hook it up to a piano like, <laughs> it's like, like make, like put, put a child to this, right? Like they'll just, they'll love it, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and yeah, it it doesn't. It's really it doesn't take that much to to adapt this to to scenarios like like assistive music composition. You know, it's like it's kind of like you're uh, writing with the LSTM. Here's your you know composing with the with. It's not an LSTM exactly, but um, you know composing with a neural network that will give you suggestions to how to fill in the melody right here. Or what's a chord sequence that you know would be a nice you know counterpoint or something to to a particular melody? So there's there's all of these different use cases, and uh, so this is kind of the future of music composition, perhaps, or maybe at least maybe music composition in the in the kind of like an like the i the garage band you know version version of uh, music composition, right? Crazy stuff. This is a really great project. Um, they they had this at um at the um at the last Europe, so they had like a booth where you could just go. That's why I got to play with this, and it's, it's really fun. It's like it's addictive. You just like jam away at it, and it just makes cool music all the time. It always plays in major. Sorry. It sounds like it always plays in major key. Uh, it doesn't have to. It's just whatever it was trained on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they they trained it on major key because you know they wanted it to sound great. <laughs> Uh, what do I have this conditioning models? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So you can condition uh, audio on on anything. So like here, this is conditioned on vocals. So Lyrebird is this company that basically provides voice modeling. And uh, back in the, when they first started, and I think they still have this, but they have a demo where you can they ask you to recite a bunch of sentences into a microphone, and then they make a model of your voice. And then once they have the model of your, vo your voice, you can make it say sentences for you. So this is like. Have you heard about this new technology? So they demonstrate an Obama. An algorithm to copy voices. Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. Is it? Oh, oops. Um. Oh, it won't play for me. Let me see if they they actually they might still even um have. They have this demo online. Oh, what? What is this? Oh, I think I have to. Oh, I'm just there. Yeah, please. Let's see. No. Okay, fine. Um, I have a recording of myself. Hey, Doc. Have you heard? strong and also gives shade. Oops, you so about get... Oh, they have. <laughs> hey, Doc. Have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. This is huge. It can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? 
Hey guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. Close to believable, right? I mean, it's a little warbly. Their intonation is off, but but it, they, you know they were able to do that without their permission, right? Now, there's a demo where you can recite a bunch of sentences and they capture your voice, so then you can make yourself say, say, say things. So this is me. Hope is strong and also gives shade. The, the pipe begins to rust while new. These rock friends deserve jail. The, the right taste of cheese improves with age. Cats and dogs each hate the other. Move the bat over the hot fire. The hawk crawled under the high fence. Act on these orders with great speed. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? It does, doesn't it? Um, Hillary was the worst thing. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, wait, oh, this is definitely not two weeks ago. These slides are a little old. <laughs> this is probably like six months ago or something. Uh, wave, glow is, wave Glow is actually a, um, I forgot what it was. It, I think it was, might even be again. Anyway, the point is there's a bunch of good audio generation models. There's also been attempts to do audio style transfer with, with very limited success. Um, I'm going to skip that because it's, it's really weird. Okay, so this is the last thing I wanted to show you uh, that, about the audio. And this is, this is the sort of musician's dystopia that I really want to convince you of. So, um, okay, so you, you, and you already hit the nail on the head, right? Like the iPod of the future is it, we're able to generate music, right? So um, there's a little bit more that we can do to it um, to, to make it even more interesting. Uh, but but to but to to get to that, I first have to make a little quick detour to something else, which is co the idea of content-based music recommendation. And this was some work that Sander Dillman did a little while ago when he was, uh, I think, an intern at Spotify, um, and with limited progress. But but it's plausible that this might get better. So the idea is to recommend music based on the audio. Uh, as a, now, you might ask, as opposed to what else? Um, the way that we generally do music recommendation, like the way that Spotify recommendation works, for example, is not based on the audio. It's based on what's called collaborative filtering, which is that it generates recommendations based um, on the uh, listening patterns of different users, right? So the audio itself is, is not part of the recommendation. Uh, it, probably not, mostly. Um, it's kind of, the, the idea is that let's say all of us have a music taste and we log all the songs that we like and, you know, let's say that, you know, two, two of you have the same taste in music, right? And, um, you know, person A has listened to song X, but person B has not listened to song X and so, but they otherwise agree on all the music that they like. So it's plausible that person B will also like song X and so you can recommend that music, you know, to them. Um, that's how, generally speaking, uh, not just music recommendation, but movie recommendation and just content recommendation in general works. But uh, the problem with that is, of course, like um, it doesn't work well for new music because no one's listening to new music yet, right? So there's this cold start problem, as it's called. And you know, if you if you like, if you listen to a lot of U2, it'll just keep on recommending more U2 to you, right? Because you know, all the U2 songs sound the same, and so. Um, so ideally, we'd like to be able to, or, or sorry, <laughs> that's true also, but all, you know, people, yeah, there's a problem of like kind of self-reinforcement kind of, it doesn't really work so well. So ideally, we'd like to be able to recommend music because it sounds similar, right? Like doing the audio analysis. And so the way that uh, Sander Dilliman approached this problem is by trying to do this kind of, you know, sort of like word to vec right? Embedding points in a feature space. So what they do is they try to embed uh, albums or songs into some kind of a feature space based on the audio, you know, kind of the way that you would do with images. And they would also project the user. Uh, so yeah, two songs are similar because they have similar projection. And they would project users into the same space. And so these, these latent factors, they're kind of like, you know, perceptually meaningful audio features. And so, you know, this user likes the this combination of perceptually use uh, perceptual audio factors and these two songs have those audio factors and therefore this should be a good recommendation recommend this music to this user right and the way that you would try to embed you would try to Im, uh, find these embeddings by running some kind of a audio regression model that would try to learn the embedding from the audio directly itself and the same thing and, and also um uh, sorry yeah that, that would be where so you embed the audio from, uh, or you learn the features from this regression model, and then you also, it's a lot of com 
I know it's a lot of like uh, sort of math and stuff, but basically like trying to project the users and audios into the same space. And they did this like evaluation that showed that they, it has some advantages. You know, it, if you do like a audio, uh, like a, if you do a prediction, you maybe get some some less less popular music that 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 has a similar sound so it works a little bit better than what you would normally get from collaborative filtering which keeps on recommending daft punk if you like daft punk right so who you know so it's not particularly useful um it didn't work as well in a lot of evaluation tests so it's not really used that much it's really hard to do audio analysis so it doesn't it, it's not really a big thing right now but maybe in the future it will be and so he showed how you can do this analysis and then every uh like a, a, a um, th this refers to, I forget what this are. This is the, um, this shows like these different bands uh, represent different feature vectors, which represent audio features. So audio features might be something like, you know, um, ha uh, vocal harmony, you know, or uh, six, four time signature, or, you know, maybe genre specific stuff, um, things like that. And, and actually, like a really cool thing that if you read this blog post, it's really cool. He generated Spotify playlists based on uh, a bunch of songs which will, which, uh, which activate kind of, uh, you know, like a, a bunch of songs which activate a particular feature very nicely. So um, you get like playlists that share one thing in common and it's like, you know, something like, uh, you know, uh, maybe the key, but usually something more abstract. So like, for example, um, like vocal harmony is a good one, like things that have vocal harmonies. Um, would you be able to understand that on the playlist or is it something? Yeah, um, I forget. They think maybe the playlists were labeled with that, but um, yeah, some, something like that. I read this a long time ago, uh, but it's, it's a really nice blog post. I would check it out. So, okay, so like now let's connect the dots. This is what I mean by iPod of the future. So we can do synthesis based on uh, like, like remember, th so what this was, right, is recommendation based on audio factors. And we can also do synthesis based on audio factors, right? So I mean, that's what uh, speech synthesis is. The factors are, are the words, but they can be more abstract. They can be speaker identity, or maybe in the case of music, it can be based on these features, right? So what if your iPod of the future, you know, basically projected you into, into the space of audio features that you like, and then generated music based on those audio features. So any given time you pick up your iPod and you turn, put on the headphones and maybe there's some biometric sensor that's measuring how you feel. And then it gives you like a set of custom, uh, a feature vector, which, which is kind of like the optimal music that you want to listen to at that given time based on your mood state and uh, your past listening preferences and so on. And it just generated music on the spot for you at that given moment. And then all of us were listening to our own iPods and all of the music was generated on the spot for that one instant and never again, you know? So like we're just listening to a constant stream of optimal music based for just you and nobody listens to the same music. And not only does no one listen to the same music, but even you only listen to one song once. It's like, it's like optimal for you. So this is kind of the, this is my version of the dystopian iPod of the future. <laughs> I think yeah. that would drive me crazy. Yeah, I me repeatedly too. listen to the same song and then get sick of So it. maybe it would just play the same song, but based on that model, you know, because it would learn that you like to listen to the same thing over and over. I think my final so, is at this point. So then, the, um, so yeah, this is, yeah, this is me connecting the dots. You have your wave net and then that, that, the, and then that, that just feeds your, <laughs> oh yeah. And then this is the whole thing that I showed last week about like, uh, you know, generating stuff from dreams, like this, it, it, everything just. Crazy, right? Like, um, so okay, where does this leave musicians in this picture? Like the usual, without the money to pay the rent. <laughs> starving, starving artists. So, will we stop making music? Are we gonna stop making music? This is this is my optimistic note for the end. No, of course not, because um, humans actually value handcrafted things. So, like, even as AI progresses, the cost of human crafted things. Uh, increases so like uh, you know like humans really like things that were made by other humans for some reason who knows um, we're weird like that and so and so I think you know people will always make music even if there's no commercial need to do so anymore like you know the the whole music market is taken up by AI people will still make music just the way they did a thousand years ago before there was a music market to begin with um, it's just kind of a human impulse I think 
And so there's always going to be a place for us in the future. So that's the end of the lecture. And I just want to mention a quick note about next week. We're going to talk about futuristic stuff. And uh, how do you guys like this session? I know some people were maybe a little bit, I know it's like two and a half hours of lectures is like a little bit gratuitous. Uh, we usually have something more practical for the second half. I'm just sort of out of easy, easy practical things to show you. There, there is like, a, like, okay, so maybe, oh, actually, you know what? How about this? Like, in next week, instead of doing this at AI Lab, maybe I'll do the Glow tutorial um, during next week's class, and I'll just try to do this, this futuristic stuff a little bit quicker. Um, but basically, the stuff that I wanted to show you was, uh, was talk about reinforcement learning, which is really like your, your, the pinnacle of sort of deep learning. You know, trying to make agents that interact with the world and do things like play video games. Uh, which is what this is all all is and um, and then talk about my my pet project of the future which is Abraham who knows what I'm talking about have I mentioned Abraham before well I'll mention it next week um, so so that's all uh, before we get to this course evaluation business do you, um, does anyone have any questions on the materials that we looked at today so there were a few links to practical materials that you may find useful for um, you know that like like again the the sentence encoder I didn't look at the notebook very much but if you if you want to look at that it might be it might be kind of useful for some people who want to do language stuff and um, yeah um, any questions okay so my understanding is you all have a link to the class where you can tell you know George and Dan and, every, and everything like you know how horrible how horrible I am. And um, just uh, go ahead and fill that out. I think it's supposed to take you 10 minutes or something. I guess I have to fill one out too, maybe. I don't know, actually. I'll have to look at that. Maybe, maybe, maybe I just misunderstood. I read the email very quickly. But, um, but you all have the link, right? It's like in your email. So just go ahead and fill that out. You guys can you know, spend the rest of the class. I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to leave the room. So, you know, because I can tell what you're typing just by looking at you. Um, but uh, but I, I you you don't have to stay here to do it. Just do it. Basically, like the point is, just fill out the form at some point, and so then everyone everyone will be happy. So that's it. Uh, next, uh, so we're off for that. Have a happy have a happy Thanksgiving or whatever. Merry Thanksgiving, and uh, I'll see you guys on. I'll, I'll see you guys Tuesday. No way, Alan. Okay, ciao.